Thunderstorms are one of the most violent expressions of weather on Earth. And in this video lecture, we're going to be learning about the ingredients that must come together to make a thunderstorm. Now, the images that you see here on the bottom, this is what we call an ordinary thunderstorm, one that is probably non-severe, uh, forms quite frequently across much of the globe on a daily basis. But occasionally, thunderstorms become severe. And when they do that, they typically take on one of two different forms. Maybe it'd be a squall on, like you see here, moving through East Central Illinois, or possibly a supercell. Both types of thunderstorms we're going to be studying extensively in the next few lectures. But what I really want to get into today is what ingredients come together to make this happen. So let's get a couple of the basics out of the way first. What do we call thunderstorms? Well, the cloud type is called a cumulonimbus cloud. Okay, this basically means Latin for, for heaping cloud. Okay, these clouds develop vertically, which means they rise upward in the atmosphere, kind of like the small ones you see down here in this picture across the bottom. All thunderstorms, just by nature, they mean called thunderstorms thunderstorms have lightning and thunder. Now, when is our typical thunderstorm season? Well, if you look down here at this graphic you see in this uh, kind of the middle right side of your screen here, what you're looking at is for 2006, just a random year here, it shows you daily the count of severe weather events being from winds, hail, or tornadoes. What we typically find here is that the severe weather season typically starts probably at the beginning of March, reaches a peak sometime in May and June, and then wanes as we get into September into October. So we're going to call it March to September. Across the United States, uh, we have this map up here that kind of shows us the number of days per year with thunderstorms. We see the hot spots down here uh, in Florida. We can have along the Gulf Coast thunderstorms any time of the year. You know where I'm recording this lecture here in Champaign-Urbana, we have on average about 45 days a year of thunderstorms. Due to the the lack of one ingredient, the stability or the instability of the atmosphere, the west coast and the northeastern part of the United States uh, have very, very few thunderstorm days. Now, when it comes to problems, um, our 10-year averages when losing lives to hail, uh, severe winds, tornadoes, and flash floods, we're talking about 223 deaths per year on average. Property damage, about 12.5 billion add agricultural damage onto that, that's 2.4 billion, a lot of that coming from hail and straight line winds. But as we continue to kind of unpack the thunderstorm and how it works, and we're going to talk about all of its destructive aspects, don't forget this. A single small thunderstorm, a little one, can contain over a billion gallons of water. Some of them contain tens of billions of gallons of water. They, they, weigh, they weigh millions of tons, these, these massive storms. But here's the question. If there's so much water contained in these thunderstorms, these little ones in the background here, this picture I took in Urbana, how in the world are they supported? How do they hang out in, in the atmosphere? What holds them up there? In other words, what makes air rise? You see, our most confusing ingredient of the four ingredients that we're going to study is this one where we discuss the stability or the instability of the atmosphere. We're going to try to understand what makes air rise like this. So in order to do that, we have to understand something neat about the way the atmosphere behaves. We call these rising chunks, we call them parcels in atmospheric sciences, parcels of air, these chunks of air that we watch move throughout the depth of the atmosphere. And they can rise and they can sink and we're going to watch how they change as they ascend and descend. You see, as an atmospheric scientist, I am a person who is forever searching for where air rises, like you see in these videos, and where air descends. When air rises and does so violently, you get these massive thunderstorms like the ones that you're watching. When the air descends, well, the sky's clear, and you get beautiful weather. So let's try to figure all of this out. So I want you to watch this video here. What we're watching in this video is a hot air balloon race. This is in Reno, Nevada back in 2006. It's one of my favorite videos to watch. You've basically got all of these uh, hot air balloons being filled here. And, and as the air fills the, the canvases, uh, they, they become buoyant and they take off. Now, if you understand how a hot air balloon works, you actually understand the basics of parcel theory. You see, the atmosphere, while it doesn't have, you know, big giant pieces of canvas holding parcels together, it turns out that the way that these balloons behave as the air uh, kind of is lower density due to its heat on the inside of the balloon, the way that it behaves in rising like this, well, the atmosphere can do the exact same thing. And that's a really cool feature to try to understand and learn more about. So let's try to unpack that. I want to get to this, uh, this slide and really kind of digest these topics we're discussing here. First, what is stability? Stability is the resistance to change. So I got a simple example up here. Uh, if you have a boulder sitting in the, in the middle of a valley here and you try to push it up the side of the valley, well, you know that as you push the boulder up the side, if you let go, if you stop applying that force, 
it's going to return to its initial position, which is at the bottom, and you might get hurt along the way. You see, that boulder is very resistant to change. We perturbed it, we moved it, we applied a force, and it just keeps coming back to where it started. On the flip side of this, check out what happens if you put that boulder on top of the hill. You see, any small change, any small force applied to it will unbalance it, it will be unstable, and it will accelerate away from its initial position. You see, in the atmosphere, we're going to try to figure out how we can get air to accelerate upward all by itself. And to do that, I want you to understand the idea of a parcel. Now, what is a parcel? It's a blob of air, a chunk of air that we can identify as it moves throughout the atmosphere. So, for example, if we just kind of look right here, we could say that what makes up this thunderstorm is a big giant parcel of air or a whole bunch of smaller parcels of air all being forced to kind of rise in this area. Now what we want to understand is how does that parcel interact with its environment? And the environment is everything on the outside of the parcel. So it's this kind of clear air that I'm coloring in around it. What's very unique about the way that parcels of air behave in our atmosphere is that they tend to not mix well with their environment. That's why the cloud can remain kind of a standalone thing with a very kind of defined edge on it like this. And that's because it is not mixing very well with its environment. And therefore it kind of stays together as one feature, one identity. And therefore our goal, our goal for the rest of this particular lecture here is to understand this key idea. How do we compare what happens inside the parcel to outside the parcel? How do we compare what's going on inside the thunderstorm to the environment that surrounds it? Because if a parcel is behaving as an adiabatic process, it doesn't mix with this environment. Like for example, see this parcel of air right here? It's got nine molecules in it, just as an example. With time, as it ascends, the same nine air molecules are inside of it. And that's what I want you to see. You see, our atmosphere has the ability to move these big blobs of air all over the place. And as they're moved around, they will obey the first law of thermodynamics. And that's what we really want to study in this particular lesson. So here we go. Let's get down to some basics. First things first, rising air cools by expansion. Now, what are we talking about here? Well, if you take a chunk of air and force it to ascend, it goes up in the atmosphere. Well, I'll kind of draw over this real quick to kind of show you what I mean. If that parcel of air is maybe this large at the surface, if you cause it to rise up in the atmosphere, it will expand in size. And the reason that it'll do that is because down here, the pressure exerted on the parcel is high. But as the parcel uh, rises, it gets into you know higher and higher in the atmosphere where the pressure is lower. And that allows the internal pressure to push out and cause the parcel size to expand. Now, what's the point in understanding that? Well, as the atmosphere kind of relents on its, on its external pressure, confining the parcel into a small space, well, the parcel gets bigger and kind of works and pushes against its environment. And as that happens, well, the parcel gets bigger and cooler. So rising air cools by expansion. You may have experienced this, maybe not necessarily with rising air, but have you ever, you know, sprayed some hairspray? Have you noticed that as you do that, the, as the hairspray comes out of the inside of that container where it's all compressed and held in tight, it expands and it comes and hits your head and it's, and it's cool? Well, that's a good example of how this works. In fact, some air conditioning systems rely on this process of expansion uh, to cool. On the flip side of that, sinking air warms by compression. Uh, if you need a good example of this, think about maybe using a bicycle pump. You know that if you hold the bicycle pump and you start to push the, the plunger in to fill the tire full of air, as you hold the, the cylinder over which you're, you're pressing, or, I'm sorry, you're, you're compressing that cylinder, uh, the pump is going into the cylinder, well, you know that it warms as you hold it. You know, it's the same thing uh, that happens inside the internal combustion engine. The, the, the pistons are compressing a mixture of gas and air and a spark plug ignites it and that whole compression process leads to heating and that's really how your uh, your car engine works. But let's get back to the main point here. If you allow air to rise, it cools. The process by which it cools is called expansion. When air sinks, it warms. It warms by compression. We've actually even discussed this. When we talked about hurricanes, I told you that air descends in the eye of a hurricane, and as it does so, it compressionally warms. Now, this is the cool thing about our atmosphere. There's a law called the first law of thermodynamics. And from that law, we're actually able to prescribe, we're able to, to know exactly the rate at which air cools or warms by rising or sinking. And this is neat. 
<clears throat> the term is called the dry adiabatic lapse rate. What does that mean? Well, dry means its relative humidity is less than 100%. Adiabatic means it's a parcel. It's not mixing with its environment. And lapse rate means temperature. And the dry adiabatic lapse rate is approximately 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Now, what does that mean? That means a parcel of air, so a chunk of air, that has a relative humidity below 100%, which means it's dry, it will cool at that rate as it ascends and warm at this rate as it descends. So think of it like this. Let's imagine I had a chunk of air right here, and that chunk of air at the surface uh, had an internal temperature of, let's just call it 20 degrees, okay? Sorry, trying to write here in PowerPoint. If you allow that parcel to go up one kilometer, we know that it'll expand in size, and its temperature will cool off 10 degrees, which means its temperature when it gets here would be 10 degrees Celsius, because that's 20 minus 10. So we can kind of see how that works. The exact opposite happens as the thing descends. Okay, this is what's really cool. As a parcel of air rises and cools, it gets closer and closer to saturation. You know that in order to saturate the air that you're in with water vapor, you know, if you want to saturate it, all you need to do is cool the air. You can get a chunk of air that rises and cools and therefore leads to condensation. Now, if that happens, your rising parcel of air makes a cloud and its lapse rate stops cooling at 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer and cools at a much slower, well, approximately six degrees Celsius per kilometer. And the reason why that is, is right here. You see a parcel of air that's rising. Watch this one over here in this animation in the upper right. As these parcels of air are rising, they're cooling at 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. But they've actually cooled to the point that they're saturated, and that's why the cloud begins to form there. The humidity hits 100%. Now, as that happens, condensation begins, and condensation releases heat. Turns out that it releases heat to the tune of about 4 degrees. So instead of being able only to cool at 10 degrees... We're pumping some heat into it, allowing it to only cool at 6, and that is key. So if the dry adiabatic lapse rate is the rate at which the parcel cools as it ascends when the relative humidity is below 100%, the moist adiabatic lapse rate is the rate at which the parcel cools as it ascends if we're actively making a cloud on the inside of the parcel, just like you're watching in this video. Now this is pretty amazing. As this air is ascending inside of this thunderstorm here, these parcels are ascending so quickly that they're briefly penetrating, see it right there, into the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is up here. The troposphere is below this cloud feature here called an anvil. There it is again. And this, is a, this video is called explosive convection because we've rapidly destabilized the atmosphere, allowing, allowing air to rapidly ascend, cool, get condensation, makes these clouds, and this is a powerful thunderstorm. Now, in atmospheric sciences, we need to figure out a way by which we can diagnose the atmosphere to see if making something like this is possible. So this is where the whole idea of stability comes in. Watch this. In the bottom right, I have a picture of a massive thunderstorm, and I have a weather balloon underneath it. I'm going to launch this weather balloon <clears throat> into this thunderstorm. And as I launch this weather balloon into this thunderstorm, it will be inside of the parcels of air that are rising here. I'm going to launch another weather balloon outside of it. This balloon that's outside of it will measure the environment surrounding the parcel. Remember our idea. Compare the environment to the parcel. If the parcel temperature is warmer than the environment, well, just like a hot air balloon, it continues to ascend. That's what we're trying to figure out. So watch. Balloon number two goes up. See it there? And as it does so, it traces out the temperature and the dew point temperature of the environment. The temperature is the right line. The dew point temperature is the left line. Now, because balloon one is going to be going with the parcel, ascending with the thunderstorm, I know that its temperature can only change at one of two rates below the cloud, when the relative humidity is below 100%, it will cool at 10 degrees. In the cloud, it will cool at 6. This is what the parcel does. And watch, as that balloon ascends, these are the rates at which it changes. Now look very carefully at this. The slope of this line that you see right here that I'm kind of highlighting, the slope of that line is 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Once we got into the cloud, which happens right here at this kink, we start to cool at 6 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Now, why are we doing this? We're doing this for this one reason. Outside of the storm, 
This is what my temperature profile did. That's called the environment. Let's put it on the large diagram in the bottom. Inside the storm, the environment changed like this. That's what the parcel is going to do. Let's put that line on the sounding. Here is your goal. Your goal is to figure out if the parcel of air is warmer than its environment. That's our key idea, remember? Anywhere where the blue line, which is the parcel line, is the right-hand line on the diagram, it is the warmest thing. So what do we want to do here? Well, check out the notes are on the right. You see, we go out and we measure the atmosphere all the time. Every day we launch weather balloons to try to measure what the atmosphere is doing. That's the environment. Well, as atmospheric scientists, we always want to know, is the environment supportive of making thunderstorms? Well, because we know exactly what a thunderstorm will do, we know exactly what its behavior will be like in terms of its temperature change as it rises, we simply go onto every single diagram and draw a parcel line, like you see here. And this is what we do. This bullet point over here on the left-hand side is the most important part of this whole slide. You see, anywhere where the temperature of the parcel, that's the blue line, is warmer than the environment, that's the right black line, the atmosphere is unstable. The air will rise. Why? It's warmer than its surroundings, just like a hot air balloon. Anywhere where the parcel temperature is less than or colder than the environment, it is stable, and no thunderstorms will form. So every day, every time there's severe weather, we are out watching stuff just like this. We're going to get a live example of this at the end of this video. Okay, let's try to put this all together. We're going to watch this video that's going on in the background here. You have this massive supercell thunderstorm. There you can kind of see it in time lapse. Let me fast forward a little bit for you here. I want to answer three questions. Why are the bottoms of most thunderstorms flat? You can see it down here. You can also see it right there. Why does the middle part of the thunderstorm bubble like this? And why is the top flat as well? Let's answer those questions. So here's a static image of a thunderstorm. The first thing I want to talk with you about is I want to teach you how to find that flat bottom to the thunderstorm. We call it cloud base. Technically, we call it the lifting condensation level. Now, what is it? Well, we know that we're getting air to rise here. So as air rises into this uh, thunderstorm, it will expand and cool. And at some point as it rises, expands and cools, it reaches a point where condensation begins. And that marks the very beginning of the base of the thunderstorm. Now, at the LCL, the lifting condensation level, also called cloud base, we've allowed the air to rise and cool to the point that its temperature equals its dew point temperature, the relative humidity equals 100%, and if you remember back from a couple lectures ago, the saturation vapor pressure equals the vapor pressure. That marks the bottom of the storm. Now to kind of show you what this looks like in, in fast motion here, you can actually see air rising right here into the main updraft of this storm. Can you see how as the air is rising, it's reaching saturation, it's reaching condensation. Now this is not a nice flat bottom, this is actually a wall cloud here, beautiful to see. But you can see the air rising, and as it rises it expands, and the expansion leads to condensation due to cooling. Look, right there is the active formation of cloud due to rising air incredible video to see that. Just blows me away that we have such great video evidence of this. Okay, next, why does the th thunderstorm bubble? Well, at some point near the bottom of the storm, the parcel, as it rises, becomes warmer than its environment. And as that happens, that's the part of the atmosphere where we call the uh, atmosphere unstable. It's typically unstable from that point where the parcel first becomes warmer than its environment, all the way to the very top of the storm where we see this anvil cloud forming. And it is in this region that the atmosphere is completely destabilized and is supportive of vertically rising air all on its own accord, not being forced by anything else other than being warmer than its surroundings, just like a hot air balloon. We call this again the unstable part of the storm and that is why it looks to bubble like this. These are rapidly rising parcels of air. They're ascending in the updraft all by themselves. The point where that starts is called the level of free convection. We're going to come back to that point in just a few moments. You can see, though, that as this air rises, it eventually slams into the stratosphere. When it does that, the stratosphere is very stable, and that's because the temperatures up here begin to warm again. Well, you can't fly a hot air balloon into hot air, and it's the same thing with the rising parcel of air. 
The moment that it hits that very stable layer called the stratosphere, it must spread out horizontally, creating this cloud called an anvil cloud. We also call this in atmospheric sciences the equilibrium level. Now, let's dig deep into our kind of ultimate weather nerd here and figure all of this out. Uh, check out this picture before we get there, though. This is the anvil cloud as seen from above. So the LCL is way down here, kind of in the murky part that you can't see. So this is a storm seen from above. Here's the destabilized part of the atmosphere. There's the anvil. And here are a couple of points where the updraft is kind of briefly penetrated into the stratosphere. It won't make it too far, though. Now, to watch all of this, check this out. Let's go to a minute 112 in this video. And I want you to see this. See this massive storm? There's the flat base. The level of uh, the lifting condensation level cloud base. We then understand that this is the part of the storm that's destabilized above about right here. We have that, that lift uh, level of free convection, and on top here's the anvil cloud, and this is the equilibrium level. Watch it. See they are rapidly ascending and rising in this area, hitting the stratosphere and spreading out horizontally. There's those rising parcels of air. They're unstable. They're rising only on the fact that they are warmer than their environment. So again. This is the parcel, this is the environment surrounding it. Let's figure all this out. Okay, what we've got right here is a real sounding, and I've got our three lines on here. I've got the temperature of the environment, I have the dew point temperature of the environment, and I have the parcel line. Now, few questions that we want to answer here. First, let's find this thing called the level of free convection. I've marked it with an arrow. You see, our goal is to always compare the parcel temperature to the environment temperature. Do you see that from the bottom of the sounding, this is the ground, that the first time where the parcel, which is this thin gray line, becomes warmer than its environment is right here on the diagram. That is the point where, just like a hot air balloon, the parcel of air can continue to rise all by itself. We call that the level of free convection. In your notes, as you're watching this, it's the first point where the parcel line becomes warmer than its environment. Next, let's find the equilibrium level. That's where they crisscross again. You see, the equilibrium level is where we find the top of the thunderstorm, the anvil cloud. That's where the parcel temperature crosses back over the environmental temperature line. This is the top of the storm. In this case, the equilibrium level is about 435 millibars, which we just read off the y-axis. Next, let's find cloud base, the LCL, the a lifting condensation level. Remember, to find this, you're looking at your parcel line, and you're looking for the very distinct kink in the parcel line, where it goes from cooling at 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer to 6, and that happens right here. You see, these are the major components we're trying to understand. Now, I'm going to teach you about a way by which we kind of cheat and find a really quick and dirty way of assessing the stability of the atmosphere. You see, we're, we know that if the parcel's warmer than its environment, it's destabilized. So why not just do a quick check somewhere in the middle of the atmosphere? Let's do it at 500 millibars. You know we use indices all the time when monitoring the stock market, right? There's the Dow Jones Index, there's the S&P 500. You know, we watch these indexes to get an overall assessment of how the market's performing. We do the same thing in weather. At 500 millibars, let's just compare the temperature of the environment to the temperature of the parcel. We're going to subtract from the environment the temperature of the parcel. So the environmental temperature, right here it is at 500, just go off and read it off the bottom, minus 26 degrees Celsius. Parcel temperature, it's right here. Go down to the bottom. It is minus 23 degrees Celsius. So negative 26 minus negative 23 is negative 3. And here's the rule of thumb. If the lifted index is negative, if the lifted index is negative, the environment is supportive of severe thunderstorms. Again, we calculate all of this at 500 millibars. Pause the video, go back and watch that again to make sure you understand it, or we'll get some more practice with it in just a few moments. Next, when we design these diagrams, area on these thermodynamic diagrams represents energy. And what I've just color-coded for you right in through here is called CAPE. Whoops, CAPE. CAPE stands for Convective Available Potential Energy. The more CAPE you have, the bigger and badder the thunderstorm is. Now, in PowerPoint, this is what our storm looks like. Cloud base is here, the LCL. At this point in the storm, it becomes unstable and begins to bubble up. The equilibrium level at the top where the anvil cloud is formed is right there. So this is how this all works.
Now let's come back to that idea of lifted index. I'm going to show you some real data here. On the left, upper left, I have a sounding from Lincoln, Illinois, uh, early in the morning on November 17th, 2008. The parcel line is the dashed blue line, so we're looking right over here. Here's the dew point temperature of the environment and the air temperature of the environment. The lift and index, well again, it's the temperature at 500 minus the parcel temperature at 500. And here's the diagram, or sorry, here's the table that tells you how to assess this. So let's give it a shot. What is the temperature of the environment at 500 millibars? So here's 500, go over to there, and here's the temperature of the parcel, same level. Read them off the bottom. We do that and come right down here, we see that the parcel is substantially colder than the environment. How much so? Well, the environment's minus 24, see it? The parcel's negative 43, so negative 24 minus negative 43 is a lifted index of 19. Anything greater than positive 3 is very stable, no significant weather activity, and this is a crisp fall day. Boring, okay? On the flip side, look at this sounding over here. In my nerd world, this is about as awesome as it gets. We chase this sounding. We barbecue on this sounding. We chase this. 500 millibars. Temperature of the parcel, temperature of the environment, the environment is substantially cooler than the parcel. How much? Well, the temperature of the parcel is, is 5 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the environment is minus 8. Negative 8 minus 5 is negative 13. Now, what does that mean? Well, our, our table down here says you're extremely unstable if you're below minus 6. We're way off the chart by more than double. This day, we also had all of that cape. There was 7 thousand joules per kilogram of cape. Now, I know that's a new number I just threw at you. What does it mean? Well, let me just tell you. We did some great research to understand severe thunderstorms. Turns out that you typically only need about 1,500 to make some of those violent storms on the face of the earth. We were at 7,000. And if you come over here, we had no cape. Not once does the parcel become warmer than its environment, so it's a no cape environment. Now, I want to show you what happened on this day. On this day, there was a Cubs game, and I was at Wrigley Field, and this massive line of storms went racing through Chicago, producing five different tornadoes. See the anvil up here? This massive anvil on top of these storms? Well, as these storms went over Wrigley, thankfully Wrigley did not get any tornadoes, but they saw sustained 60 to 70 mile an hour winds, causing a major delay in the game. Look at this, this is absolutely incredible to see. You see, this is what a destabilized atmosphere is capable of. Again, five tornadoes in the Chicagoland area, thankfully none of them hit Wrigley Field. Now, I know maybe some of you are, um, not many of you are, are Cub fans, maybe some of you are Cardinal fans. Check this out. I'm going to take you down to Bush Stadium. This was a day when we had a massive squall line that came over due to a destabilized atmosphere. Everybody went inside the stadium instead of watching the game because it was uh, delayed. See all the people standing here and here? Nobody's standing here because the storm is coming through the field and this opens up to the field and the winds are racing through here in the downdraft of the storm. Watch what happens. Here comes some garbage cans and a condiment cart. Watch it again in slow-mo here. Boom. <laughs> okay. I think he was okay, although I don't really know. But this is what happens when the atmosphere destabilizes. You get these powerful thunderstorms. Now, if you take a class above this called Atmos 201, I will show you a little bit different thermodynamic diagram. It looks a little bit different. We call this a skew T diagram, but it's the same idea. Here's our parcel line. There's the cape in the environment. The lifted index on this day, minus 8.55. This was a very, very destabilized atmosphere. All this energy perfectly available to make for massive thunderstorms. And this is what actually happened. This was May 20, 2013. And on that day, this massive EF5 tornado went racing through Morocco, Oklahoma. I know, we're not. And there you can see it. You see, before we had any idea that this was going to happen, go we north. had to assess the stability of the atmosphere. Listen to it. You can yeah, hear it. It's an incredible Listen. tornado. This, combined with this wind shear, Listen is what made roar. all of this happen. That's why we try to assess oh the God. stability of the this atmosphere. Is not good. Please, Massive EF5 tornado. Lots okay, so we got all that down. Let's get some practice. Okay, we have our parcel line. All parcel lines look like this, okay? 
the temperature of the environment looks something like that. Here's what I want to ask you. At what level is the lifting condensation level? Now stop and think about it. This is cloud base. You know that there's a very distinct feature in the parcel line that tells you where that is. Got your answer? Well, remember, we're looking for the kink in the parcel line, and it happens right here. See how it's cooling at 10 degrees Celsius? And look at the blue dash line, then 6. That particular point is right here, and that is at 900 millibars. So the correct answer for the cloud base is 900 millibars. Let's do another one here. At what pressure is the level of free convection? Now remember, our clue here is to look for the point, starting from the ground going up, where the parcel line becomes warmer than its environment. I see it right here. You see that the blue line is cooler than the black line, the outside black line, till that point. That happens at roughly 750 millibars, which means D is our correct answer on this one. How about another question? What is the pressure at the equilibrium level? Well, for this one, remember, we've got to go all the way to the top of the sounding to look where the parcel line crosses back over again. And that happens right here, which is roughly 175 millibars. So that's how we can find these. And if you want to replay this to see how I did this again, please take the time to do that. All right. What's the value of the lifted index? Well, let's calculate this. 500 millibars. Go across and read off the air temperature. We could call this somewhere close to, I don't know, minus 16, minus 17. What is the temperature of the parcel? Well, it's found right here. This is about, uh, we'll call this minus 11 or minus 12. Therefore, the difference is approximately 5 degrees, a negative 5 degrees. So the lift and index is minus 5. That means the parcel is 5 degrees warmer than its environment at 500 millibars and therefore unstable. That's how we do this. Okay, some fun questions here to make sure we're all up to speed here. If the atmosphere is said to be unstable, uh, I'm sorry, it, uh, let's try that again, true or false, the atmosphere is said to be unstable if the parcel's temperature is warmer than its surrounding environment. Think about that. Is the parcel unstable if it's warmer than its environment? Absolutely, yes it is. This is a true statement. Let's try another one here. True or false, a negative lifted index indicates an unstable atmosphere. This is also true. Negative lifted index, unstable atmosphere. Another one. The stratosphere, remember that's the layer above the troposphere, is defined by a large temperature inversion. Is the stratosphere a stable or unstable layer? Well, the stratosphere, remember, Warming with height, you can't fly a hot air balloon into hot air, so this would be a stable situation. The air does not want to ascend into the stratosphere. And our last question, which body of water do you think is the primary source of moisture for thunderstorms in the Midwest, which is where we live right now? Uh, is it the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Great Lakes, Gulf of Mexico, or the Muhammad Aquifer? Champaign University of Illinois and Champaign-Urbana sits on top of the Muhammad Aquifer. Turns out the answer to this one is the Gulf of Mexico. We've got to study that in the next few moments. Okay, if we start to understand what it takes to build a thunderstorm, let's get through the other three ingredients. The first ingredient, the, the unstable atmosphere, takes quite a bit of time. But the other ones I think you're going to see go pretty quickly. All right, we need something to cause air to rise, right? If we're going to get it to rise, we know it needs to rise into an unstable atmosphere. Well, what gets it to rise in the first place? We need a trigger. And a trigger is anything that can cause the air to rise, just like we talked about with hurricanes. Okay, to get air to rise, you can have one of these different mechanisms. Air can simply converge at the surface and rise, or it can be along a front and rise. It can get lifted over a mountain and rise. A sea breeze can cause it to rise, or it can actually just rise because it gets hot. You see, all of these things are all just examples of anything that can cause air to rise. That's what I want you to remember. Trigger mechanisms causing air to rise. Let's look at a few of them here. This is a diagram, a cross-section of a front. We have cold, dense air coming from the north, maybe out of Canada, meeting warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. The warm moist air being less dense than the cold air from Canada, well, the cold air undercuts the warm moist air, and the air rises. If the atmosphere is unstable, massive CB, or cumulonimbus clouds. 
making huge thunderstorms. Let me give you an example of this. Here's another example of a, of a, of a trigger mechanism like a front. So in this particular satellite image, I've got Nebraska and Kansas in here. You can see how moist everything is on this. I see all the clouds here, but see how dry this dry little pocket is? It Well, that's because this dry wedge of air was pushing its way out of the desert southwest, and it was slamming into this warm, moist air coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Well, they met right here on this line, and right there, as this air slammed into that air, it had one place to go, and that is up. And as it did so, it produced these massive supercell thunderstorms, 57 separate supercells, 53 of which produced tornadoes. Incredible to see that. Again, triggered the air to rise there. Let me give you another example of this. Here we have kind of in the panhandle of Oklahoma, Texas, and parts of, of Kansas, we have uh, two air masses colliding. I got the arrows drawn there to show you how this works. Now, if I have air coming from this direction on one side and this direction on the other, when they meet in the middle, air is forced to ascend. And as air ascends, well, this is my PowerPoint version of a thunderstorm. Air is forced to rise. So we're looking at ways to get air to go up. Surface convergence makes that happen. You can also get air to flow over a mountain. As air flows over a mountain, it's forced to rise. Rising air expands, cools. You get condensation and clouds. See it in these pictures? Check out this video in the bottom left. Air is coming out of the bottom left-hand corner and rising over the top of these mountains. And as it does so, destabilizes, and makes these big thunderstorms you see here. Pretty amazing to be able to see that. The mountains triggered the rising air. It's like a ramp just forced it to go up. And by the way, you can even find cloud base or the LCL. It's right there. Cool to see that. Now, not every time air goes over a mountain is it unstable. For example, check out this video. This is Mount Rainier in, what, uh, in the Northwest in Washington State. And what we can see here is that air, as the air rises, it's going over the top of this mountain. Well, look, the air's not destabilized there. So it just makes this cap cloud called a lenticular cloud that sits on top of the mountain. It's what actually shrouds the top of, of Mount Rainier almost all the time. It's, it's a beautiful way to kind of visualize this. And by the way, I want to show you one other thing. When air goes down the back sides of mountains, as it sinks, it compresses and warms. These are the uh, tabletop mountains here, also called the tablecloth mountains. Uh, the air kind of flowing over the top of them. They're descending, compressionally warming, and evaporating. So when air goes up, you make clouds. When air goes down, you get rid of them. Really neat to see that happen. Okay, here's another way we can do it. Florida Peninsula sticks out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. On either side, you have this uh, of the very hot peninsula. We have relatively cooler water. Well, during the day, the atmosphere responds to that by creating higher pressure here, higher pressure there, and here's the land. Well, it has lower pressure because it's hot. Air comes running in from the coasts, and as it does so, meets a little bit of surface friction, forces the air to rise, and as that air rises, it makes thunderstorms. This is why Florida has so many thunderstorms throughout the year. Almost daily, they get a sea breeze, and that sea breeze kicks off rounds of thunderstorms. You can also do this. If you trigger air to rise simply by heating it, some pockets of the ground just get hotter than others and cause these rising thermals of warm air. It creates a lot of turbulence, but broad-winged birds love to fly on it. See this video here in the right-hand side of all these broad-winged hawks? Well, they're not flapping their wings because they're riding on these rising thermals of warm air. Sometimes they can rise high enough to get uh, condensation to form to make a thunderstorm like you see just right here. So these are all just ways. What you need to remember is these are all just ways to get air to rise. Third ingredient. Our third ingredient is surface moisture. When I chase, I look for any time where the dew point temperatures are at least, are at least 60 degrees Fahrenheit. If they're at least 60 degrees Fahrenheit, I got enough energy to make a massive thunderstorm. Now, what we see here in this upper right hand corner is a map back on that day of that Cubs game. We had dew point temperatures kind of everywhere on the right hand side of this line that were well over 60 degrees. That means this whole area was primed for thunderstorm development. We even had in this little pocket here an extra boost where we had dew points over 75. This is disgusting summer air. It's so humid. The little boost you see here, well, we know that our primary moisture source is the Gulf of Mexico, which means we're going to be transporting moisture from that region into the Midwest. But you can get a secondary source from evapotranspiration. That's where water is basically evaporating out of the soil and out of plants. In August, our corn crops in Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Missouri, Indiana, you know, this area, uh, they're rapidly losing moisture to the atmosphere to the tune of about 4,000 gallons of water a day into the atmosphere. That's from one acre of corn. So that's what gives us this boost in humidity here. Remember, you got to have that 
humid air. Now here's the thing. If you have all of this, you end up getting stuff like this, rapidly rising air. And sometimes as the air rapidly rises, it can really produce massive destructive thunderstorms like you're watching right through here. You see, I'm teaching these ingredients because they all have to come together. A destabilized atmosphere, a trigger mechanism, and abundant moisture to make massive storms like the one that you're watching right now. Okay, with that, let's put the pieces together. Thunderstorms, they're composed of two major components. One is an updraft. Updrafts are where we have warm, moist air that's rising. It's triggered, something forces it to rise. As it does so, it expands, you get cooling, condensation, massive thunderstorm shows up. Now, as the thunderstorm rises, we're releasing lots of heat inside the storm. It's a warm feature, and it just continues to rise and rise and rise until it gets all the way up to the top of the troposphere. These updrafts can be violent. Some of them, the air can rise at speeds over 100 miles an hour. You don't ever want to fly an airplane into an updraft of a thunderstorm. It will rock that plane like you've never imagined. Now, as the air rises, it eventually hits the tropopause, the equilibrium level, the top of the storm, where an anvil cloud forms, and all thunderstorms produce anvils. At this point, what went up is going to start to come back down. We call that a downdraft. The downdraft is defined as this really cold pocket of air that's full of precipitation that's falling to the ground. So if the updraft makes the cloud, the downdraft is where the precipitation forms. So again, the downdraft is a cold, dense pocket of rapidly descending air. Now, the reason why ordinary thunderstorms are rarely severe is because the ordinary thunderstorm is missing a crucial ingredient. And that ingredient would be the one thing that would allow the thunderstorm to live beyond about an hour. You see, in this case, the updraft, the red arrows, and the downdraft, the blue arrows, are kind of co-located. They're in the same spot. So what went up was ultimately destroyed by gravity pulling the downdraft back down, killed the storm. Now I want to show you what these updrafts and downdrafts look like before we figure out what we need to get them to become separated. Here's an updraft. Amazing to watch this one. Rapidly ascending parcels of air in a destabilized environment. Negative lift index, a lot of cape. Air rises, slams into the stratosphere, the equilibrium level. Here's the stratosphere up here. There you go. That's the rising pocket of air. See it? That's an updraft. Downdraft. Well, let me show you one of the most severe types I can show you. Watch the, underneath this thunderstorm. You're about to see that pocket of very dense precipitation loaded air descend right here in the storm. There it is, see it? Slams into the ground. This is actually what we call a microburst. So if the updraft is the rising air, the downdraft is the descending air. Loaded full of precipitation here. Watch it again. Boom, there it goes. Amazing to watch that. Okay, with that, let's figure this whole thing out. First, updraft made these clouds. The precipitation created this downdraft. You can actually see it as it slams into the ground, spreading out horizontally. Amazing to see that. Now, watch this. If you have an environment where a thunderstorm forms and there's no wind shear, well, what we're going to be missing here if we don't have wind shear is there's nothing to separate the updraft from the downdraft. Now, I want you to watch me draw this for you here. What we've got over here is here's the surface. Here's the top of the troposphere called the tropopause. If the winds don't change in direction or speed with height, well, your thunderstorm, I'm going to draw you just a generic thunderstorm here, will rise up like this. It'll hit the tropopause and spread out just like that, and your storm will look like this. So it'll be composed of an updraft. But if there's no wind shear to blow the top of the storm off, the downdraft comes right back down on top of the updraft, killing it. You see, there's no wind shear in this environment, so storm goes up, downdraft comes down, storm's dead after just about an hour or so. In this case, I have wind shear, which means my thunderstorm, as it rises, okay, it's actually going to be able to move downstream. It's going to be forced to kind of move off like this, and my anvil cloud spreads off in that direction. And as that happens, what we end up getting here is the thunderstorm actually comes up, and it tends to look as though it kind of tilts off in this direction. Well, that means the downdraft falls out over here. And we've now effectively separated the updraft, which is this part of the storm, from the downdraft, which is this part. This is what wind shear does. Now, I know I taught you wind shear destroys hurricanes, but 
Severe thunderstorms need it. Watch this, okay? Here's a thunderstorm forming in an environment with no wind shear. Watch with me. I have some depressing music here to listen to as it goes up. You see here the storm is rising. This is good. This looks like a good rising parcel of air in an unstable environment going straight up and down though. You see, that's our problem. You see, there's no wind shear to blow the top of this storm off. So the air rises. And as it goes up, no wind shear, the downdraft forms, and look at that, comes right back down on top of the updraft. And as the music would, music would suggest, this is kind of a depressing situation, and the storm is basically dead. Now, over here, we're going to add wind shear in techno. Are you ready? Okay, air is rapidly ascending. As the air ascends, Okay, we gotta turn this off. As the air ascends, look, the top of the storm is getting blown off in this direction. Yeah, my example up here, I blew it off in the other way, but look, the downdraft starts to form over here, not impeding the updraft. And as a consequence, the air can continue to rise on the backside and the rain falls out on the front side over here. You see, this storm survives. These two videos are the same length. This one is healthy, it survived, the wind shear providing the separation of the updraft and downdraft, keeping this whole thing going. You see, if you want to make massive thunderstorms, you need wind shear, you need a trigger mechanism, you need an unstable atmosphere, and you need moisture. Now, watch this. Right now, the Storm Prediction Center for uh, April, or, sorry, April 13th has got this area in through here, not only in a marginal, but a slight and even an enhanced risk of severe weather. They got a pretty high probability that it's going to be quite nasty in through this area. Now let's take a look at what's going on right in through here, where we've got this at least 30% chance of seeing severe weather. I'm going to show you the model forecast for this time. Let's get our trigger mechanism and our moisture out of the way first. This is a map showing you Friday, April 13th in the evening, where we're seeing our trigger. Do you see that right along this line? I have winds on this side coming from the west or northwest. And on the other side of the sign, I have winds coming from the south and southeast. They're colliding right here. This is surface convergence. And do you see that right along here, I have dew point temperatures that are above 60 degrees. That's this color that you see in through here. I have really high dew point air, that's really juicy air, being lifted by this boundary, this front. Now, is the atmosphere unstable? Well, there's a lot of different ways we can look at this. Let's just look at a map showing us CAPE. You see CAPE, again, stands for Convective Available Potential Energy. I know I taught you about what it looks like on a sounding, but look at this. We can see right in through here, we have this whole area where we have high values of CAPE. Uh, what's the lifted index? Well, we can go look at that. Remember, we want negative lifted indexes. Let me scroll up here for you. We see that the negative lifted indexes are color-coded here. Look at how low the lifted index is. Here it's minus 10, minus 6, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7. We have really unstable air in this area. So we have an unstable atmosphere, we have plenty of moisture, and we have a trigger mechanism. Do we have wind shear? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to show you right over here bulk wind shear. When you look at this, we're looking for high values. What you notice is in that same area, I have plenty of wind shear. That means the surface winds are much slower than winds aloft. And as a consequence, we are expecting severe storms on Friday, April 13th, to have nasty severe storms right in through this area. So that's it. These are the ingredients. This is what you have to look for. Trigger mechanism, surface moisture, unstable atmosphere, wind shear. Those are your four ingredients.